Let's talk about JavaScript. Does anyone know why JavaScript is the most popular programming language in the world? Why? Correct. That's the only reason. Yeah? The only but very important reason. JavaScript is not any faster, any better, or any more performant than other languages. It's not none of that. Actually, if you look back, JavaScript used to be very poor in terms of performance. Yeah? Some people call it toy language. Yeah? And at some extent it was true. Yeah, I've been doing JavaScript and only JavaScript for 17 years, so I've seen the progress. You're right. JavaScript was the only language, only one, that in 1995 got married to the web browser. At that time, 24 years ago, a web browser was something weird. Yeah, but today, I hope you, you agree that the browser is everywhere. Yeah, it's in the laptop, even on the TV, right? So, uh, yeah, that's why JavaScript is so popular. Um, do you know how long it took the creator of JavaScript to create, uh, write the first version of the standard? No? Give me a number. Ten years. Less. Way less than that. It was two weeks. Yeah. Some people said ten days. Some people said fourteen days. I guess it depends on whether you count the weekends or not. But yeah, it was roughly two weeks. Yeah. Something obviously very, very simplistic. Yeah. All JavaScript wasn't that good in many aspects, as you can imagine. And the thing is, some of these bad decisions obviously have been inherited. So today, 24 years later, you still need to deal with that. But hey, it's what it is, yeah? It's what it is. But today, well, I like to talk about modern JavaScript, because fortunately, JavaScript became so popular that the coding community realized that there was a lot of potential. If that language, which is crap, works and is very popular, what if we make a lot of effort to make sure it gets better, right? So, when we talk about modern JavaScript, what exactly are we referring to? In here, you can see all the different versions of JavaScript. So, what is the line? When is the line that defines what modern JavaScript is? It's not that obvious there isn't any common understanding about yeah, JavaScript went modern on the 1st of April. No, obviously it's not like that. There are, generally speaking, two approaches. <coughs> so one of them says that JavaScript became modern in June 2015, when ES6 was released. Yeah? You know when on LinkedIn you get job offers of recruiters that they never touch any line of code and they talk about ES6. Yeah? They have no idea what they are talking about. So ES6, also called formerly called ES2005-15, was released in, in 2015. Um, I'm not, I don't necessarily agree with that. That release was very important because starting from 2015, TC39, TC39 is, a, is a group of Swiss people, or people based in Switzerland, in the mountains somewhere, somewhere, no one knows, who looks after the standard. So starting from that year, they realized that it didn't make sense to bring a new major release of JavaScript every five or four years. There were so many changes. It was so complicated to adopt all these changes by the community and by the web browsers. And the starting from 2015, they said, hey, wait, not anymore. Do you know Agile, Scrum, Kanban? Yeah, It's about shorter releases, continuous delivery. So JavaScript itself adopted that pattern. Starting from 2015, every June, uh, there is a new version of JavaScript, one year, maybe just a few changes, but which is good, right? Because it's easier to learn. You don't have to spend months of your life like happened between 2011 and 2015. I personally believe that modern JavaScript started in 2011. Why? Because in 2011, the language introduced some methods, some utilities that today is very hard to imagine how to code, how to deal with JavaScript without them. Anyway, that's not important. The important thing is to understand that JavaScript has evolved a lot. And to prove that, I would like to show you some examples. Things that run in JavaScript, real examples of code written in JavaScript. So <coughs> if you want to buy a new car, let's see if there is any volume. Oh yeah, there is, look. Yeah, so this is written in JavaScript. This is freely JavaScript. It's just a web browser. You can look around. 
you can check all the details, panels, the steering wheel, the seat, you know, all the details, yeah? That's a real example of, of quite sexy JavaScript. You can play with song, with music, you know, lighting conditions, you know, all these sort of things, yeah? So that's example number one. Example number two, VR, of course, virtual reality. If you work as a JavaScript developer, you know that in London you can make 180,000 K a year. And once you make that money, probably you can buy a nice apartment in the coast. So you can build it or you can design it with JavaScript as well. You can see, you can interact with the furniture, you can select materials, colors, many different things, yeah? Which is pretty cool, I believe. Again, I didn't have to install any software, any plugin. It's just literally a web browser. It's a link, it's a URL on the internet, yeah? I'll show you my favorite. You look at the leather, right? It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's good. Yeah? Cool. And the last example is gaming. Yeah? JavaScript is the only language in the world, the only one that runs everywhere. Yeah? That means that if you want to build a game, classic, the classic approach, not only a game, any sort of application, if you're thinking to create an app, you have to know that if you create a native app for iOS, it will be fantastic. But at some point, if you grow as a company, you have to create an app for Android or vice versa. And then you have the web and then you have desktop. You know, many different environments. I've been working for some huge companies where we have maybe 200 people doing literally the same thing for different devices. That doesn't scale anymore. Companies like Amazon, that apart from money, they have really good engineers. They realize that with JavaScript, they can do the new features once and deploy it everywhere. Yeah. Actually, the Amazon Web App, even though you install it in your phone to spend all your savings, in reality, it's JavaScript. And it's the same code that runs on the browser. So the gaming industry, they realize about that as well. And that's pretty recent, but now you can have amazing 3D games. Probably that's not the best example. But anyway, here, you see, it's just a game where you need to find the exit. And every time you find the exit, you go to a next level, and then you got items, and then you got enemies, and you know, all these sort of things. And the incredible thing, which goes beyond the scope of this session, is that that game runs great in a web browser, anywhere in the phone, in the tablet, yeah? So, hey, hello? Yeah, this sort of thing, yeah? Gaming is not my best skill. <laughs> right, so this is just some very, you know, uh, visual examples of things that you can do with modern JavaScript. So today, in the next probably 40 minutes, I would like to talk about some of these techniques. Right, so I'm assuming if you want to, uh, you know, to play a bit with JavaScript that you know how to open dev tools. If you don't know how to open dev tools, yes, it's as simple. I'll quickly do that for you, so yeah, for your reference. So you open a new tab anywhere, ideally in an incognito. Chrome sometimes fails to deal with uh, JavaScript snippets. So if you open incognito window, it will work, generally speaking, better. You click in anywhere, right click, inspect. There is a shortcut for that, of course. And you'll get something like that. So on the left-hand side, on top, you'll see different tabs. You have to select sources. And then once you select sources, on the right arrow on top, you click on it and you'll find an option called snippets. So then you can create any snippets. As you can see, we can have as many snippets as you want. Yeah? Unfortunately, it's a bit hidden. It's not obvious how to deal with JavaScript in the browser. Yeah? But anyway, at least we don't have to install any software. Yes, everyone has Google Chrome, everyone has Firefox, whatever. Everyone has a web browser. Yeah? And any modern web browser gives you the option to deal with JavaScript. So, uh, what sort of techniques are we talking about? Probably the most popular in modern JavaScript is the REST parameter. Yeah? Do you know which symbol are we talking about? Uh, REST parameter. No? REST parameter. Mm -hmm. The REST parameter is dot, dot, dot. Yeah, we'll see what that means and why this is so beneficial. It has two purposes. So it works in two modes. Let's create a function in JavaScript. So I'm going to create a function called display score. You'll see at the end of the session why I'm talking about the scores. Can you see the screen, by the way? Yeah, I think it's readable, right? So as part of my display score, 
I'm going to invoke it and then I would like to uh, call the function passing a number with the score of a player. Imagine that we're creating a gaming application, so every user has a different score. So if we pass number 87, we can capture that number here. And then we can do return score. So if we do that and we execute the snippet, you can run the snippets by pressing that button or with the shortcut, Mac users, command enter, Windows user, <coughs> control enter, Linux users, I'm sure you know how to do it. If you click in here, you'll see at the bottom the output, the result of execu executing that snippet. Yeah? So that's pretty obvious. Obviously, we can complicate that a bit more. For instance, we can do uh, D score is, yeah, you can combine strings and uh, variables. Yeah, it's not part of this session to explain how the fundamentals of JavaScript works. Yeah, if you're interested on, on understanding how to create a function, how to return a value, we have a dedicated session, Intro to JavaScript, that we run every three weeks. But for now, assuming that you understand the idea we're trying to build, you see the score is at the bottom 87. Fair enough. Of course, if I change 87 with 19, <coughs> it will display the score is 19. Yeah, it's not nothing as exotic, as sexy as the 3D game we saw three and a half minutes ago. But anyway, it's a starting point. And now let me ask you something. What happens if we have two scores? Yeah, imagine that our players have uh, participated in two games. So as part of the first game, they got score 19 and score 87. Two scores instead of one. Technically speaking, we can do that. Score one, comma, score two. No problem at all. We can pass multiple arguments. And then we can change the message and say, the scores are, and then score one. We can build a string, yeah, somehow. Something like that. We can display two scores. No problem at all. And then, as you can see at the bottom, the scores are 19 and 87. And what happens if instead of two, we have three scores? I hope you get the idea I'm trying to deal with. If we got three scores, again, we can pass score three, blah, blah, blah. But what happens if in reality, we don't know how many scores, how many times our user has contributed, has participated in the platform. That may happen, right? Some users may have played only once, some users may have played hundreds of times. So this is why the REST parameter is so convenient, because with the REST parameter, the first mode or the first way, the first way of using it is as a gather operator. So what gather operator means? It means that because we don't know if we have one score, we don't know if we have two scores, we don't know if we have a million scores, in which case the user may have a social issue. Well, you can do something like that. You can type dot, 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 scores. You can put whatever variable name you want here, but the important thing is the three dots. Dot, dot, dot. With dot, dot, dot means, A, I'm sorry, but I don't know how many arguments my function has. Because of that, please gather, collect them all. Does anyone know what type of data scores is? It's an array. It's a list, correct. It's a list. The technical way to describe lists in JavaScript is arrays. So that means that now is we display scores. Look at the result. The scores are, uh, yeah, you see, uh, wait a minute. Let me try again. Yes, correct. So you can see the result. The scores are, and then if you pass two numbers, you got it here, yeah? If you pass three numbers, the same. It doesn't matter, look. You see? Seems stupid, but the thing is, without the REST operator, it was much more complicated. You had to write two, three lines of code. It simplifies a lot your life. Does anyone know if, apart from the scores, we have the username? Like something like that. 
Does anyone know how to display the scores for user, whoever, are, whatever? Yeah, so now, instead of having just a list of undetermined scores, we also want to display the scores for whoever, the name of the player, are, yeah? So we want to dynamically change the message depending on who is uh, logging in. Second? Scores. Technically speaking, we could use score zero, that's the way to access the first argument, but that's a bit dirty, yeah? That's a bit dirty because if you want to, for instance, calculate the average of scores, you have to slice the first element because it's not a number, yeah? It's not ideal. The best way to do that is, look, I can pass an argument here. Yeah. Again, the name or, or the way you call the argument doesn't matter. I can call it Brexit if you want. Yeah. The important thing is the first argument will be assigned to the first variable. And then the rest, you see, everything else on the right hand side will be captured by our array of scores. In other words, You can do that. Even though the semantics are horrible, and we won't get the job probably providing that, but at least that should work. Yeah? So you will see the scores for the name of the player are blah, 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 blah. So obviously, if we change the example and we change the number of arguments, it's literally the same thing. Yeah? Our function is very sexy, it's dynamic. It doesn't care the name of the player. It doesn't care how many times that player has participated in the platform. Yeah? Talking about semantics, let's rename that to username. A bit off topic, but still part of modern JavaScript. This is the classic way of combining strings and variables. You see the pluses? Plus, 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 plus everywhere. That's classic JavaScript. In <coughs> modern JavaScript, there is a different way to do that. Does anyone know how? Template literals. Template literals. That's perfect. Template literals. Template literals is a new pattern in modern JavaScript to combine strings and variables in a more human friendly fashion. How do we use template literals? I bet that half of you have never press that key in your keyboard. You will see, if you're a Mac user, at the bottom, something called, what's the name of that symbol? Backticks, back correct. If you're a Windows user, the backticks are, generally speaking, on top left. So using backticks, look, I'm going to literally type the same example. So lines number three and four will be absolutely equivalent, but hopefully you'll notice that line number four will be easier to uh, to build. So the scores for username are, look at the syntax, dollar and then curly brackets, scores. These two lines are equivalent. First of all, that strategy, that approach is slightly shorter, as you can see. But on top of that, it's way more readable and less error prone. Because as soon as you start dealing with complex messages, it's very easy to mess around with pluses, spaces, you know, not good. With the backticks, it's much easier. You see, you got the same result in a more natural way. Backticks. Hmm? By the way, does anyone know what's the name of this case? You know, here we have two words, username. And they're joined by a capital. What's, what's that? It's camel case. That's correct. Why camel case? Correct. It looks like a camel, right? After smoking some cigars. Right. So what happened if instead of camel case, we do that? What's the name of this case, guys? No? This is typical in PHP. Yeah? This is snake case. Snake, yeah, it goes up and down. Why? Don't ask me. <coughs> and what happened if back to the username, 
if we replace the very first character with a capital. This is not camel case. What's that? This is Pascal case. Why? Because Pascal, which is a very old programming language, was the first one to, you know, introduce that sort of syntax. And the last one, this is the only one that is not supported in JavaScript. So you cannot create a variable, and you'll see in a minute how Google Chrome starts blowing up my laptop as soon as I start trying to do that. Oh, so if I type user das name, Again, this is not blue, blue, blue. You see lots of red colors everywhere. What's the name of this syntax? Ooh, interesting, interesting, interesting. If you are probably below 50 years old, yeah, well, let me rephrase that. If you're above 50 years old, kebab case will sound a bit weird, right? Because the first or the original way to describe this case is Lisp case. Why Lisp? Because again, similar to Pascal, Lisp was the first programming language to introduce it. However, if you're below 50 years old, why 50? I don't know, I just made it up. Yeah. Going to Stack Overflow and talking about Lisp case is like talking about, you know, something, you know, MySpace, something weird, something old. Yeah. So in the modern coding, we call that kebab case, yeah, because correct, you're completely right. So you see the hyphen, the dash like the blade, you know, that uh, goes through the meat in the kebab, yeah? sort of. Anyway, let's go back to our uh, camel case, which is the sort of a standard way to create variables in JavaScript. Does anyone know who decides what the standard is in JavaScript? Because this is not part of the standard. Technically speaking, this is as valid as that. Yeah? Even as that, or as that, yeah, you can, you can mess around. So this standard doesn't say anything. The only thing it says is you cannot use kebab case, fair enough. But between the others, you can use any of them. Does anyone know why 99% of the developers in JavaScript use camel case? It's convention. Convention. Created by who? <coughs> Java. Java, wrong. It's not Java. No. So there are some big actors that are trying to decide how we should write JavaScript. Yeah? So two of them. The classic one is Google. Google has a very uh, important style guide. And according to Google, when you create a variable, you should use camel case. Yeah? However, there is now a competitor, a very strong competitor to Google, which is Airbnb. correct. It's Airbnb. Yeah? Airbnb decided to publish a different style guide. And it became so popular because it's a very simplified version of the Google one. So Google says, if you create a variable, use camel case. However, if you create a constant, do that, you know, with capitals. And if you create whatever, then, you know, it's, it's complex. It's, it's correct, it's strictly speaking really good, but it's not pragmatic because you need to remember many, many rules. So Airbnb <coughs> said, hey, Let's keep things simple, right? JavaScript is complex enough. Always use camel case, yeah? And because of these sort of things, uh, Airbnb style guide became so popular. All right, any questions so far? No? Airbnb. Airbnb, yeah, 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 yeah. If you search Airbnb JavaScript style guide, there is a GitHub project with all the rules and all the recommendation and all these things, yeah? Cool, good stuff, guys. So this is the rest parameter. This is the first part of the rest parameter when we gather, when we gather all the arguments. However, let me show you a different example. Rest parameter can work on the other way around. Instead of gathering, can spread, yeah? can, can throw values. Let me show you an example. Imagine that we have a function called get max number. Yeah? So we are going to, let's, let's simplify that to the limit. We don't pass any arguments, so we're going to hard code. Oh, no, yes, actually, let's pass some values. So get max number. We got three values, three, one, and two. Yeah? So here we can map these numbers to three arguments. Num1, num2, and num3. Yeah? Again, you can use whatever syntax or naming conventions you want. So does anyone know in JavaScript how to get the max number out of a list of numbers? 
No, there is something called math.max. This is very old in JavaScript. Yeah, but obviously it's still valid today. So you can pass a comma separated list of numbers. So what will my function return? Free, correct. Because the max of one, two, three is free, right? This is a typical silly question that we ask to see if anyone is paying attention, right? Right, so the max of three, one and three, one and two is obviously free. So, but then what happened? I'll show you a small but important things. If instead of a comma separated list of numbers, we pass an array of numbers. In other words, how many arguments our function receives now? One. Correct. We have one single argument, numbers. And the question is, can we do that? Can we pass to the max method, instead of a comma separated list of integers or floating numbers, can we pass an array of numbers? Ah, correct. Look at what happened if I run this snippet. Not a number. Yeah? Not a number. So JavaScript is unable to understand what's the maximum value of an array. And at some point, I can understand JavaScript, yeah? What's the maximum value of an array? Uh, the, the, the question is, is tricky, yeah? If we got time, I would like to show you uh, a very quick video at the end of the session with my favorite JavaScript talk ever. <coughs> four minutes of gold. However, this doesn't work. So, fortunately, with modern JavaScript, you can do that, dot, dot, dot. So with dot, 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 because we have an array, it works on the other way around. Instead of gathering numbers into an array, it takes the array and generates numbers. Yeah? So it's transforming the array into a comma separated list of arguments. Three, comma, one, comma, two. So what will the function return now? Three. Correct. Yeah? So then I hope you've seen the two ways the rest parameter works. To me, this is probably the most beloved feature of modern JavaScript because without it, even though of course you can get the max of an array, blah, blah, but it's way more complicated. You need to write two or three lines of code, looping and things like that, yeah? So that's a good thing. Any question, guys? No? Right, let's check the Next thing, this is a very good one. I love this one as well, set. What is set? So imagine that you are dealing with a complex algorithm in JavaScript where you have a list of people, yeah? And you want to remove the duplicates of the list, yeah? It's not that simple. Imagine that you have a list of fruits, apple, banana, orange, apple. Apple is twice, so we want to generate a new list. Actually, let's do that. Let's do that. So get unique fruits. So I'm going to call get unique fruits with an array of apple, banana, orange, and apple. Yeah, and I want just the unique ones. In other words, I want to get apple, banana, and orange without the last apple. Yeah. So with classic JavaScript, I'm not going to do that, but trust me, it's not simple. I had to do numbers.reduce unique fruits. I will have to create an algorithm, check if the number, if the fruit is already there, if it's there, don't add it, if it's not there, add it to the, you know, to the collection. Ugh, it's complicated, right? It is complicated to do something as simple as, yes, remove the duplicates, yeah? I think, the, the, mentally speaking, the problem we're trying to solve is fairly trivial. So, with set, we can easily remove the duplicates. And that's, look at the syntax, because the syntax is a bit mind-blowing, it's a bit mind-blowing. Um, let me do something. If we return new set, of numbers, let's see what happened. New set of numbers. Let's pay attention to the output. Look, it looks promising, right? It looks promising because 
I can visually see that I got apple, banana, and orange. I don't have apple, banana, orange, and apple. In other words, look at the size of the collection, three, which is correct. However, do you think that's an array? No. What type of data is that? Object. It's a sort of object. It's a sort of object. It's not an object. It's not an array. It's something called set. Yeah, which is a new data structure in JavaScript, yeah? which is OK. It's OK. However, generally speaking, you will see that when you start dealing with very complex JavaScript, you tend to turn everything into an array because there is nothing as powerful as arrays in JavaScript. Yeah? It's something that you'll see all, over time. Starting from 2011, we can do magic with arrays. In other words, how do we transform a set structure into a pure array. In other words, can I do that? Can I get the first element of the array? I can't. You see? With an array, I can, use, I can do square bracket zero, and that will give me the first element of the array, or a square bracket one, whatever. But because this is not an array, it looks like an array, it smells like an array, but it's not an array. It's very confusing. Yeah? We cannot do that. We, we have to transform it into a pure array first. And how do we do that? Look at the syntax, because it's a bit mind-blowing. First of all, we need to put curly brackets surrounding the expression. It's a way to say, hey, we are going to return an array, because array are declared by surrounded by square brackets. All good. And then that's not enough, because now we need to spread the elements of the set. How do you spread elements of a collection? Correct. Look. Dot, dot, dot. Yeah? That's super powerful. Boom. You see, now you got a pure array. It's literally an array of free strings. And because of that, I can do things like access the first element. What should that function return now? Apple, correct. And if I do two, what will this function return? Orange, correct, because JavaScript is zero base. Yeah? The first element is not one. Well, it's sometimes one. That's another tricky thing of classic JavaScript. For instance, when talking about dates, look at, look at the way of thinking, right? I need to drink some water to explain that. So when dealing with dates, the days, the day of the month, start at number one, which makes sense. The first of May is today, one. But the months start at zero, yeah? So, which is, doesn't make sense. In other words, today is the fourth, month fourth, day one. It doesn't make sense, classic JavaScript. <coughs> cool, so, and what happens if I type three? What will that return? Undefined, why undefined? Correct, there is no fourth element. We remove it, yeah? Our new sexy structure will return an array of three elements. In other words, the last element of the array will be index number two, correct? If we put three or three million, there is nothing, there is nothing on it, yeah? There is nothing on it. And that will simply return undefined. Like, I don't know what you are trying to do, but yeah, that's not correct, yeah? It doesn't throw any error, it just says it's undefined. Any question? No? So again, even though, even though the syntax of set is a bit is not obvious, it, it pays off, yeah, because it simplifies massively. We do lots of coding challenges. You know coding challenge, if it's the first time here, but you maybe you never heard about that. So we got maybe 20, 25 people running, we'll see that afterwards. Uh, JavaScript questions at the same time. And at the end, we saw the results. Who is the best? Who is second? Yeah. Especially when talking about expert, in the majority of the questions, you need to use set to dedupe the results. Right. So what else? What else? Ooh, this is a really good one. Destructuring objects and arrays. Right. So... Uh, let me show you an example again. Imagine that we got a list of, uh, how to explain that, a list of characters. 
characters, which is an array of three elements, Donald, Kim, and Boris. <coughs> and then I want to create three variables to save each individual character, something like let first character equals characters zero. Yeah? And then second character, second character, characters one, no problem. And third character, third character, characters two. And once you do that, then you can do whatever you want, right? Console log, the characters are, and then whatever. First character, second character, third character, yeah? Something like that. And if we run that, yeah, it does work. So it's all good, no problem at all. However, with modern JavaScript, there is a way to simplify that mess. This is a bit boilerplating. We need to do the same thing three times. With modern JavaScript, I'll commend that. Look at how sexy this is. You can do let square bracket, first character, second character, third character, equals characters. It's literally the same thing. In one line, you see, I'm initializing three variables. So what will be the value of the first variable? It will be the value of the first element of the array. What will be the value of the second variable? The value of the second element of the array. And what will be the value of the third variable? The value of the third element of the array. Yeah? Easy. So if we run that, it returns the same, but in a shorter way. It's a good shorthand. What happens if I have a fourth character? What will it return? Undefined. That's absolutely correct. Again, the same thing, yeah? We don't have any fourth character, just undefined. No problem at all. And what if we, can we do that? Can we just access the first and the second, ignoring the rest? Of course we can, yeah? Of course we can. So first character will be assigned to the first index of the array, second character will be assigned to the second element of the array, and the others will be simply ignored. Yeah, does it make sense? Cool, fantastic. It does work, yeah? So it's all good. So this is array destructuring. But then we also have object destructuring. Again, let me show you an example. I'm going to create an object. Do you know what an object is in JavaScript? It's a collection of key value pairs, yeah? Imagine, think about a database, yeah? With you have different properties about users, about documents, about whatever. So my character will have few properties. First name, Peter. Last name, Williams, yeah? Age, 91, it's pretty old, our friend. Yeah, whatever. So, again, the same principle. What if we would do, want to do a console log of each individual property? We can do let first name equals, how do we access the first name of the character, guys? Correct, character.first name. <coughs> and likewise, we can access last name, and then we can access the Age, character dot age. You see the idea, right? I mean, the name of the variable doesn't really matter. We can call that Brexit if you want. Yeah, doesn't matter. But just for semantics, for readability purposes, we should think a bit about the naming conventions. It's interesting when you interview someone and you check his or her uh, GitHub account and you see weird names like X, Y, and Z. What do you think about that? Not very readable, yeah? There is a classic but horrible excuse, which is, yeah, but I don't care because I'm working by myself. I don't have to, to share my code with anyone. That's wrong. Every software company has at least two developers, you and you after six months. So even if you are not collaborating with anyone, if I call that, look, look at how horrible that example is. If I do that, Yeah, sorry, I just 
you know, my keyboard, I spent like three grand on my laptop and now it's missing all the keys, right? I cannot type ERT, which is it's making everything a bit more challenging. Anyway, <laughs> so phone number, right? This is probably the worst thing you can do. It is, that's even worse than XYZ. If you go to Google, there are many, many people in the blogs and medium and stuff like that talking about readable, clean code. But there is one guy, it's very fun. I mean, he's, it's, it's sort of joke, right? But it's fun to read because he says, no, no, no. Look, I'll tell you something. If you write readable code that everyone understands, the company may fire you, right? You're not necessary because, you know, everyone will understand that. It's better to do that. Write horrible code that no one understand, right? Do things like let i equals 17. Do things like that in the middle of the code. Why, do you think anyone will ever remove that line of code? Of course not. It's like, oh, I have no idea what that means, but I leave it there just in case if I remove it, everything fails, yeah? So his point of view is, again, it's, it's a joke, but <laughs> that he, we should do these sort of things. Anyway, let's ignore him for a period of time and let's just talk about that, yeah? So, again, that, that's, that's okay, that's valid, and now we can do console.log and then uh, the props are first name, comma, last name, comma, and age. And it's all good, yeah? We waste a few minutes of our life, but it's all good, it works. With modern JavaScript, you can simplify that. You can do something pretty sexy, which is let if uh, arrays are surrounded by square brackets, objects are surrounded by curly brackets. So we can do that. You see, match, match, match. Oh, not H, sorry about that. That should be character, yeah? Much, much, much simpler. How this works? That means please create three variables, first name, last name, and age. So what's the value of first name? The value of first name is the same as the result of evaluating character.first name. What's the value of last name? The value of last name is the same as evaluating character.last name. And finally, the value of age is the same as evaluating character.age. That's why if we evaluate that piece of code, it still works. What happened if we try to access the email, for instance? What will the email return, guys? Correct, again, the same principle. Because the email is not part of our collection, JavaScript doesn't know what to do. It returns undefined. JavaScript got much, 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 much better over time trying to normalize the standard. So if you try to access an element of an array and it doesn't exist, it returns undefined. If you try to access an element of an object and it doesn't exist, it returns undefined. As we'll see on the last four minutes of this session, it didn't used to be like that. Yeah, I will show you a very fun video about a guy trying to add arrays, subtract strings and doing weird things with JavaScript. Cool. Um, anything else? No? Right, so I'm not going to talk about that topic, async await, because that's a bit intense. Yes, FYI, um, yeah, with very modern JavaScript, this is very, very, very new, I think it's like two years old, you can use something called async await to simplify the way you deal with asynchronous code. Yeah? JavaScript can sometimes be hard to handle because you may have several processes running in parallel and at some point you have to coordinate them. You may want to call an API just after the previous API request has been resolved. Yeah? Sometimes it's a bit complicated to deal with asynchronous JavaScript. And because of that, async await will definitely help to uh, deal with that. Just a side mention on that, async await work with promises. Have you, heard, have you ever heard about promises? Yeah, promises is, uh, is a technique to simplify the way you deal with asynchronous code. Why I'm mentioning promises? The reason is because promises 
were created by one single guy a long time ago. So one guy was probably playing Counter-Strike or whatever, and he realized that dealing with asynchronous JavaScript is not easy. And he came up with an idea, and he created an <coughs> open source library on GitHub and stuff like that. His idea was so popular that at some point the JavaScript standard, do you remember the TC39 guys we mentioned before in the mountains in Switzerland? So they said, hey, this guy was right. Let's introduce uh, promises as part of the standard. So two consequences for him. The negative one is his library is pointless today, somehow, because you don't need to install any plugin. But this is, I hope you agree that this is something ridiculous compared to the advantage that the guy should be very proud something that he created is no part is now part of the standard that guy can work anywhere in the world right because this is amazing and that's another thing that javascript got much better over time it's not only about providing uh, predictable apis it's not only about providing predictable releases every June, every year it's also about listening to the community yeah now in javascript starting from 2015 we got classes, yeah, classes. If you come from, uh, you know, Java and this uh, CSR, we got classes. Why we got classes? Because so many backend developers, and that may sound a bit controversial, realized that there was so much effort on, you know, fostering the front-end wall, the JavaScript wall, that they jump into the front-end wall. And when a Java developer start dealing with JavaScript, the first thing he or she notices is, hey, where are the classes? How can I deal with code? It's impossible for them. Yeah? Not impossible, but it's tough. Yeah, that's why now JavaScript has classes. Does JavaScript have any sort of types, type checking? Not at all, not at all. It's not part of the standard. However, there is a very heavy project in the JavaScript community to support types. Do you know what's the name of that project? TypeScript, correct. TypeScript, which is not part of the standard, is a meta language on top of JavaScript. <coughs> Who is the creator of TypeScript? Microsoft. Correct, it's Microsoft, yeah? So this is one of the good things that Microsoft has done uh, in the IT world in the last five years, TypeScript. Another one is Visual Studio Code. Yeah, you know Visual Studio Code? If you are not very opinionated about code, probably my last suggestion of the day is please use Visual Studio Code, yeah? It's the best editor in the world. It's not what I think, I'll tell you something. I gave a conference for Google about JavaScript a few years ago, and I realized that at that time, all the Google employees, they, are, they were using Visual Studio Code. And that felt very weird, right? And they never, never seen that. And they convinced me. They told me about the, the benefits. It's open source. You've got monthly releases. It's very stable, blah, blah, blah. Of course, it's free. And there is something subtle, not obvious, but you'll see in a few minutes why this is so important. Do you know in which language Visual Studio Code is written? In JavaScript, correct, is one of the most important projects in the JavaScript community, and it works really well. So it's a great piece of software. Very complex, but really good. Yeah? Code, VS Code, Visual Studio Code. Be careful, because there is a Visual Studio, not Visual Studio with the purple icon. Visual Studio Code with the blue icon. So Visual Studio, the original one is a monster, yeah? to do ASP.NET, C Sharp, and, and weird things. Yeah? Uh, Visual Studio Code, even though you can deal not only with JavaScript, definitely with JavaScript, it works like a charm. Yeah? According to the last uh, Stack Overflow um, um, poll, you know they do like sort of poll yeah, every year where they ask the community many questions, how much money you make, what are your favorite languages, all these sort of things. Yeah? So one of, the, one of the questions is, what's your favorite IDE? Yeah? So that question, historically speaking, has been, the answer has been changing from Atom, Sublime, IntelliJ, WebStorm, Notepad. Through the history, yeah, they have been, the, the king has been, been replaced. This year, VS Code won the challenge with 51% of the votes. Yeah? So really good, just FYI. Right, so on the, last, on the next 15 minutes, I will do something different. Here at Cody, we do coding. Uh, we do coding all the time. Apart from the bootcamp we run here, we have created an online platform, which is completely free, and that's why we are mentioning it now. So everyone can join it. You are more than invited to join it to, first of all, improve your technical skills, and if your technical skills are really good, to prove your value. Yeah? Many of our members, Meetup members, got hired because of proving their talent in our platform. So 
what the platform is. If you go to coldery.com, you will see a big button said play. So if you click on it, you can sign up, which as I said, is completely free. And then you can start training with Yellowscape. So I'll sign in because obviously I already have a user. So once you sign in, we can do training. We'll see the different, you, you are again more than invited, first of all, to join it and then to, to practice. So you will see a training option, training option on the left hand side. And now here you can train JavaScript and React. Yeah? The React solution at the moment is in beta, it's private for the boot campers. We are going to add a CSS and HTML training and Python at some point as well. So let's talk about JavaScript. When you select JavaScript, which again is open to everyone, you will see three levels of difficulty, beginners, intermediate, and expert. I'll jump to intermediate straight away because I want to talk about the REST operator. So if I select, if you change the URL to intermediate instead of beginner, and otherwise if you train a bit with beginner, intermediate will enable automatically. So, uh, you will see one of the options, the three dots, is the REST parameter. So let's do a bit of training about the REST parameter. The way this works, if you use code wars, is fairly similar. You got a few questions, yeah, and you have to deal with them. The main difference is, with code wars, once you solve the questions, that's it. In our platform, once you solve the questions, you get a score, you go on the ranks, you fight against others, it's more social. So let me show you an example. Question number one. Let's do that together. Get the minimum value. We have a, we expected to create a function, get the minimum value that receives an array. Yeah, and then you can imagine that we need to do something with the rest parameter. On the right hand side, we have to write the code. Yeah. I mentioned some minutes ago that one of the reasons why BS code when it becomes so popular is because it's written in JavaScript. That editor is the BS code editor. It's literally the same source code. That's why it's so amazing. Because all the tricks, all the shorthands, and all the magic you can do with BS code, you can do that here as well. So, first of all, how many arguments our function receives? No, no, I disagree on that. We do know. One. It's only one. Just know the square brackets, yeah? <laughs> only one, only one. Yeah? Subtle, but important. We have only one argument. How would you name the ar only argument we receive? Values. Values, I like that. I will accept numbers as well, yeah? But if my, the name of my function is get min value, I will prefer, <coughs> I will choose values because from a semantics point of view, it's more consistent. And then, can I do that, return math dot mean values no why not correct correct remember the not a number n a n in pascal case with a first capital n which developers tend to forget with dot 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 however it will it will spread or gather Spread, correct. It takes an array, it will spread it into a comma separated list of individual values. So let's evaluate that. By the way, if it's the first time you train, you get a walkthrough which essentially guides you through the different options and tricks and everything. Yeah. So let's just keep that for now. Let's just evaluate it. And you will see that fortunately, luckily, the result is correct. However, do you think that code is perfect or Will you change anything about it? Nothing? No, not really, not really. It's a subtle thing. In the Codiri platform, we have the Elegance console. Yeah. And this is one of the reasons why our students get a job so quickly after the bootcamp, because they learn how to create industry standard code. So this is defined by ESLint, may, you, you may have heard about it, which is the standard to decide how JavaScript should be written. Missing semicolon. It's fair to say that semicolons used to be mandatory in classic JavaScript. Now they are optional. <coughs> yeah? Now they are optional. We presented Codiri last month in Amsterdam internationally, so we did a big challenge with 50 senior developers. And some of them complained because they disagree. 
They say, why will we get a penalty if we don't add semicolons? That's optional. Yeah? Again, nothing is white or black. We believe that semicolons are still important because that's a way to explicitly declare that you are done. Your code is complete. Yeah? Again, nothing is black or white, but this is the way we believe it should work. So if we add a semicolon, it's now sexy. Perfect. No problem at all. Right? Any question regarding the first question? No? Okay, let's do question number two. I may skip some of them, by the way. So, hmm, interesting, interesting. Look at what we got here. Get sorted array. We have a list of numbers and we are expected to return a sorted array. So, first question, again, how many arguments our get sorted array method receives? Yeah, we, we, we don't really know, yeah. In the first example, we got three arguments. On the second example, we got four. On the third example, we got one. We don't know. So, you know, say again? Variable. Yeah, an undetermined list of arguments. Yeah, we don't know. Because we don't know, how can we capture them all? <coughs> was the very first example we showed, the scores, you remember? 52 minutes ago. Three dots. Three dots, where? Here. Yeah. Correct. Dot, dot, dot and then the name of the argument. How will we call the argument this time? Any preference? Can we call it fruits? Probably not, right? I will accept values or numbers, yeah? Whatever. Cool, so now, this, what type of data values is? It's an array, correct. Do you know how to sort an array? Dot sort, that's correct. That's correct. Sort can be a complicated method. If we are lucky enough, we can leave it like that. In more complex scenarios, we may have to pass a callback function, which is something beyond the scope of this session. First of all, let's keep the thing simple. One of the main issues of creating complex software is we try to do over-engineered over a uh, piece of software. Yeah? We try to assume a scenarios that probably will never ever happen. So let's try to keep it simple. If it works amazing, if not, then let's complicate it. Yeah? Let's try that. Right, it doesn't work. Look, reference error. Array is not defined. Why it's not working? Correct. Array doesn't exist. Where is the array variable here? It's nowhere. The name is values. Yeah? And then if we try again, it works. Yeah? So generally speaking, when, we, when that happened, I used to say, I did it on purpose to see if you were paying attention, which is not the case. Yeah? I didn't notice. Mm -hmm. Right. So now it works. Did we get any penalty issue this time? Or do you think it's absolutely Perfect. It looks good, right? For instance, what happens if I do that? Correct. Let's try that. Let's try that. Ooh, you see? Again, if we do that, expect an indentation of one tab but found zero. Yeah? So if we do that, then it will work like a charm. All right? Cool. Question. Number three. Oh, that's the last one. Last question, and then we'll skip the last two. That's a really good question. I love this one. I love this one. Get merge arrays. Ooh. Ooh. We have two arrays, and we have to combine them. You see? We have to create a new array with all the numbers. Again, using the rest parameter. Without it, 
without it, there are different ways. Maybe you heard about things like push or concat. But now, let's use the rest parameter. So, how many arguments our function receives? Two. Two. Correct. Correct. Let's call them array one and array two, because I have no idea about what sort of data I will expect. Again, if you feel brave enough, you can call it numbers one, numbers two, whatever, whatever. Yeah? So now, look at how sexy the solution is using, uh, first of all, with classic JavaScript, we may have suggested uh, something like array two dot for each number and then for each number array one dot push number and then return array one something like that yeah let's see if that works it does work yeah so this is i mean when i say classic javascript i'm talking about 2011 javascript before 2011 it was even worse it was even we didn't have for each before 2011, you had to install things like underscore or load us to make it everything even more complicated. So even though that's correct, even though that's correct, actually you can also use concat. Yeah, concat is way more powerful than push. However, a classic interview question I've been asking hundreds of times in my life to candidates: Does anyone know the difference between push and concat? So concat does the same thing as push plus many others. It's way more powerful, it's stronger. Is there any reason why at any scenario we should avoid using concat, we should use push instead of concat? I'll tell you, the performance. Because concat is way more complex, it's way slower. If you want to concat free fruits, free piece of fruits, it's irrelevant. But if you want to concat three million users, <coughs> it will take 10 times more using concat that push. Yeah? Anyway, apart from that, I hope you agree that this is overcomplicated because we have to write one, two, three, and four lines of code. So let's see how to solve the problem in an extremely sexy way using the rest parameter. We can do return and then look, because I want to return an array. Oops, sorry, I typed in the wrong way. You remember when we use set, well, we put the square bracket to say, hey, this will be an array here. And then you can do that, dot, 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 array one, comma, dot, 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 array two. Yeah? It makes sense if you think about it. Why? Because it will spread all the values of the first array, one, comma, two, comma, three, whatever, comma, and then it will spread near to it all the values of array two, and that's it. So we'll have a unidimensional array of numbers. Oh. Yeah. So if we try that, it does work. Just having to write one line. You see, it's really good. I think it's really, really good. Any question? No? All right, so let me leave it here. Uh, let's see what happened at the end of the journey. I'll skip the, next, the last two questions, actually. Yeah. I'll skip the last two. <coughs> Obviously, feel free to do it by yourself. And look at what happened at the end. This is the reason why our people get the job so easily. Because at the end of the journey, you can analyze, we can analyze your performance. So we have several metrics in place. First of all, tenacity, how many questions you completed, three out of five. Accuracy, how many times you press the blue button and you fail. It went pretty, pretty well, actually, but sometimes you get people scoring zero. This is what we call Street Fighter mode. You remember Street Fighter in the 90s, the arcade game? When you didn't know how to play, just smashing the buttons. Some people, it doesn't work, and they keep pressing to see if at any of the attempts it suddenly works, which is never the case. Speed, how long it took you to complete the challenge. Focus, how many times you went to Google to Stack Overflow, and elegance, how standard your code is. Yeah? So according to all these metrics, all, all together, you get the score. Why we do that? Because then we have challenges. Yeah? So challenges is the way we compare uh, your performance. So let me show you any of them. So we run that 
two days ago. This is just a random example. So here, well, we got many people. It's a bit hard to take any 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 conclusion. But I hope you can see. You see the pentagraph is the result of showing all these scores combined. Why this is interesting? Because we do a bit of show at the end and we display the different positions. Yeah, who finished in position number tenth, ninth. Yeah, we, we try to make it as much entertaining as possible, of course. And one more thing in the respect, we also compare the code, yeah? It's not only about finding the, finding the answer, it's also about uh, figuring out, first of all, who is right, who is wrong for each question, whatever the question is. And then even if some people manage to find the answer, here you can compare them, yeah? So we can analyze which solution do you prefer, why different coding styles. Again, nothing is white or black, but it's good to learn different coding practices. So again, feel free to join the platform. We also got the leaderboards. So here you can see over time, the best players, yeah? You can see many, many people. You can do React training as well, many, many things. And the Hall of Fame, best player of the day, best player of the week, best player of the month. You know, lots of statistics by country. You know, lots, lots of different things. Yeah. So FYI, we are doing shortly a few events across London, mainly in Shoreditch. So please stay tuned in in the meetup group because obviously you will be more than invited to to join us. Yeah. Uh, also, there are some big companies that are interested on on collaborating. So yeah, it would be great if we can catch up again in one of these very posh headquarters they have in, around London. As promised, the last four minutes, I would like to show you my favorite talk ever yeah uh, i participated in many many conferences but this one is my favorite so if you search on google not now but later on javascript what destroy our software this talks about the non that sexy parts of coding yeah generally speaking when you go to a talk to a conference everything is amazing very sexy methods efficiency and stuff like that but in reality, sometimes the code is not that great. So enjoy the last four minutes of the session. <laughs>